The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to the August 30th Westminster City Council study session. Um, city Council um, also has a City Council special meeting this evening that will start at 7 o'clock p.m. If study session has not concluded by 7 o'clock p.m., we will pause, move into the special meeting, and resume the study session at the conclusion of the special meeting. In addition to in-person attendance, the community may also listen remotely by watching the live stream on the city YouTube channel or by dialing in by phone with the instructions on the meeting agenda webpage. These study sessions are not intended to be interactive with the audience, as this is time that is set aside for council to receive information, make inquiries, and provide staff with policy direction. The agenda section of the city website is the best place to check for details on participating in city council meetings. The web address is www.cityofwestminster.us forward slash agendas. I would now ask all of you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would kindly remind folks to either silence or turn off their cell phones. Um, also, typically what would go next on our study session agenda would be a report from the mayor, city councilors, and city officials. I'm going to ask my colleagues if they would be comfortable delaying this till after the presentation to be respectful of our guests' time. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I am comfortable moving in. Okay, Councillor Smith. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Pro Temp. Sounds good, thanks. Councillor Seymour. I as well, thank you. And Councillor Volz. Yes, Mayor, that sounds okay. good. Wonderful. Um, before we start, I do want to recognize that we did just have a birthday on Council. Councillor Seymour, happy birthday from all of us. Um, the first presentation and only presentation we have tonight for our study session um, is in regards to uh, the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport with guests from Jefferson County. We have Jefferson County Commissioner Tracy Craftart. Jefferson County Manager Don Davis and Air, uh, Airport Director Paul Anslow. Um, Acting City Manager um, uh, Dorr, um, if you could please assist us. Well, I guess we have a uh, um, sites. The line. <laughs> so, um, Mayor, one of you wants to head it off. Thank you, Mayor Sites. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, I'm going to be very brief. I will tell you that I think we can do this portion of this evening's meeting in the next 30 minutes. We've coordinated with our partners at Jefferson County for some very brief comments at the beginning and uh, to begin some dialogue. Um, it is our intention to have this be the beginning of a dialogue. Um, we appreciate them attending this evening, our partners, and uh, appreciate uh, Councillor Scully bringing this to our attention. Uh, we wanna be clear that uh, this is really a project of Jefferson County <coughs> here in Westminster. We just wanted to keep our council and community informed uh, as to um, the future of the Rocky Mountain um, Metropolitan Airport, uh, an important enterprise within our, our within our region. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I'll turn it to uh, the presenters from Jefferson County. Thank you, uh, Commissioner um, Kraftfarb, for your uh, attendance this evening. And uh, again, uh, Council, I think we can conclude this by seven and get to our business that's scheduled uh, at 7 p.m. Thank you. First and foremost, I wanted to say that uh, I think all of you received a full brief, but in the interest of time, I've kind of narrowed it down so the slides that I'll talk to. But uh, when we're complete, I'll be uh, more than welcome to 
uh, answer any questions. Next slide. So Rocky Mountain Metro Airport, formerly Jeffco Airport, was founded in 1960. It's owned and operated by Jefferson County in uh, FAA parlance. They are the sponsor of the airport. We are the third busiest airport in Colorado behind Denver and Centennial. And we're also a reliever for Denver International Airport. We have over 400 based aircraft and over 50 businesses uh, located on the airport. And we do almost a billion dollars each year in economic uh, activity. Important for Westminster, hard to determine you know, what economic comes from the airport goes into Westminster, but obviously Ball Corporation, Ball Aerospace is on our airport and would not be there without uh, the airport. Next slide. We are a uh, self-supporting enterprise. So we make our money, which is about uh, five and a half million dollars uh, of operating uh, budget each year from user fees. That's our leases to, for the hangars, that's our building leases. We also get a fuel flowage. Uh, that we get money from. We have investment income and then grants. And our grants come from both uh, the FAA and CDOT Aeronautics. And over the last 20 years, we've received almost $95 million from the FAA to help uh, keep our airport running. They focus mostly on runways, taxiways, and the infrastructure of that airport. Next slide. Okay, people ask, you know, how does an airport run? So Jefferson County, as I mentioned, is the air, uh, airport sponsor. They uh, formed the Airport Advisory Board in 2019, and that's a board of individuals from uh, the local area, some tenants, some business owners, some local residents. Um, one of your staff members is on our advisory board, Stephanie Trawler is, and they advise me and mo ultimately the uh, commissioners on the day-to-day -day and sort of the vision of what the airport uh, should look like. Recently, and I think it's one of the reasons why we're here, is we formed in 2021, January, the Noise Roundtable, again, which uh, Westminster is a part of. And that's all the locations around the airport. And what that is is a collaborative effort to come up with some legal, responsible uh, noise mitigation strategies. Now, I run as the airport property management, as I talked about, and the runways and taxiways are my responsibility. So I paint them, I clean them, I pave them, I plow the snow. Um, but once that aircraft takes off and goes, you know, half an inch off the ground, I have no more control over it. So that falls under the federal government, which uses the FAA as their arm to control aviation. And they do the air traffic control. So our air traffic control works for the FAA. They don't work for me, although we are partners and they do the airport grants. So people always say, you know, Paul, why can't you tell planes not to fly on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon or on Mondays? And I have no authority. It's like trying to say to you all, why do you, can't you stop cars driving on you know, Highway 36 or Highway 70? You just don't have that authority. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a, actually from a pilot map. We've added some colors just so that the clarity, but we are in the center of the map. That's our Class D airspace. That's a five mile ring around the airport. As I said, anytime that plane takes off from the runway, they're under control of the air traffic controller. And people say, well, why don't they fly to the west? Well, the west is mountainous uh, terrain. And when there's mountainous terrain, there's a lot of turbulence and there's no safe place to land. So they generally don't go to the west. They don't go to the south because that's Denver, same thing. You got a lot of population, no places to land. Over to the east, you would think, oh, that's the great place. There's nothing out east. Well, Denver airspace is out east and their airspace is right over top of ours. So if you're a pilot and you're in controlled airspace, that's either our class D or Denver's airspace. If you wanna make a turn, if you wanna to have to climb, if you wanna descend, you have to ask permission. So as a pilot who's training or a pilot who's trying to work on their maneuvers, very difficult to do that in controlled airspace. So if you look at the map, the really the only place you can go is up to the north. So people always complain that I'm directing aircraft to go up to the noise. Again, it's like saying, why can't you stop cars going north on the, you know, the highway? Why don't you make them go out to the east and around? I just don't have that authority. Pilots make their choice based on on safety and what their mission is for the day. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a picture of our airport with that class D airspace. So that dotted line is that five mile circle. You can see our runways are the, are the center. We've got two parallel runways and one cross. And the orange ovals are depiction of what's called the local pattern. People get consumed and confused about what a pattern is, why planes are flying. A local pattern in an airport is the same at every airport across the world. You're gonna take off, you're gonna go upwind, you're gonna turn, you're gonna go downwind, you're gonna to turn to final and you're gonna land. And as you're doing practice landings, that's what you do. That's the lo local pattern. 
As you move away from the airport, then you are either on an IFR, which is instrument flight rules. That's what a corporate jet or a commercial jet is. And that's what the thin green line is. And when you take off out of our airport, all of our instrument departures are a climbing right turn. Why? Because we have mountains to the west. So immediately, as soon as they break the ground, they hit 400 feet, they start climbing right turn. Same thing coming in. They're always coming in from uh, the southwest, or sorry, southeast, and kind of narrow down the path. The, uh, the thing to know about those local patterns is they're fluid. So if you point and go, well, that's my house right there. You should not be flying over my house. That pattern is fluid. If there's one plane and there's no wind, it's very easy to keep a nice clean pattern. You start getting five aircraft in the pattern with an IFR arrival and IFR departure, the tower is going to control you and extend your downwind, extend your crosswind. And so, again, these aren't like roads that you have to stay on. Those are just basically diagrams of that's the preferred uh, way you fly. But with the realities of flight, it's very fluid. Next slide. And we can roll right into the next slide. So I'm sure you all, because I get them, and I'm sure Jefferson County commissioners and county manager get them also, uh, we get noise complaints about, you know, what we're doing at the airport. It's important to note that we had about 191,000 operations last year, which people say it's never been this bad, it's, this is the worst it's ever been, which is actually not true. If you look back into 2002 and 2004, it was almost the exact same number. It was about 188,000 operations those two years, so very similar. But if you looked all the way back to 1977, we had almost 250,000 operations back then. So we've been a busy airport from the inception. We will always be busy. This is just, it's like more people move to the front range. They want to use the highways. They want to use the Walmarts. They want to use the open space. Same thing as they want to use the, uh, the airports. Next slide, please. Okay, noise complaints in households. Um, again, it's important to note that People do get upset about noise, and there are things that we are doing at the airport that we can legally do within the rules and regulations of the FAA. But it's also important to know that a lot of times there's not a lot of people complaining. It's more of a lot of people, a few people complaining a lot. So one of the statistics we like to use that in 2018, nine households were responsible for 882 complaints, which was over half of our total complaints that year. And if you look down at the, the chart, Westminster has uh, roughly 44,000 households. Individual noise complaints are 556, but only 138 of those households are complaining. So that's 0.31% of your households are making complaints about noise at the airport. So again, we take noise seriously, but I think you need to put it in uh, perspective of what's really happening out there. Next slide, please. Okay, we also talk about noise and growth. And you see that the airport has grown over the last years, but we've had higher years of operations and we kind of follow the economy. But if you go down to the chart here, Westminster in 1990 had 74,000 residents roughly. In 2019, they had 113,000 residents. That's a 52% increase. I always like to use Superior because, you know, they went from 255 residents to 13,000 residents. That's a 5,000% increase. Jefferson County's airport, increased 35% over those same years. So it's not the airports outgrowing the area. The area is growing. All the cities and counties are, are getting more and more people. And those people, some of them want to fly. So, but we are not, you know, exceeding what would we consider normal growth. Next slide. Okay, hey, people talk about what are our plans. And uh, Mr. Tripps mentioned it in his brief introduction. Next slide, please. The airport works off of several documents on, on how we run the airport. The number one, which is a federally uh, funded, FAA funded master plan. I'm sure you've all heard the, the term master plan. Um, our 2011 master plan shows, if you look up in the left hand corner, a lot of blue um, areas, that's runways, taxiways and development. That's south of our runway. So if you're familiar with the airport where Pilatus is and those big Broomfield water tanks, that was contemplated in 2011. The other area to the north of the runway is Shelt Air. Shelt Air is our second FBO. An FBO is a gas station service station for planes. Um, and they came in and built, um, starting in 2019, built an FBO. And so now we, we used to have one, now we have two. So back in 2011, that was being contemplated that those areas would be developed. Next slide, please. As part of that 2011 master plan, there's actually an airport layout plan that kind of goes into even more detail. 
And if you look at the colored uh, blocks, it was always expected that we would develop that south side. So again, it's not something that I came here. I became the airport director in 2017, December. I didn't come in and say, we're going to go to the south side and we're going to develop. And this is a brand new idea that I thought of. They've been contemplating it. The FAA has known about it, have contemplated it. They're going to fund stuff to help us do that. Um, and so it's not a surprise. Next slide, please. This is from our 2000 master plan. So even way back in 2000, if you look at that red area, that's to the south of the runway. They contemplated developing that, air, that side of the airport for aviation all the way back in 2000. Next slide, please. This is from our 1988 master plan. You can kind of see a trend coming. There are no surprises in aviation. Things take a long time. It's a, it's a long process. But all the way back in 1988, we were contemplating developing on that south side. So with that, that is a real quick down. I know we're very you know, short on time, but I wanted to give the counselors and the mayors as much time as I could to ask questions. Um, and also, I just wanted to recognize uh, Don Davis and uh, Tracy Kraftthorpe from Jefferson County coming here and supporting. And we want this to be a partnership, and I appreciate uh, having you out to, uh, to your session here. And I would likely, I'd love to have you guys out to the airport. We do a great tour. I think it's valuable for people to be on the ground and see what planes are doing, talk to pilots, talk to businesses out there. And if we could set that up, we could bring you all out there and give you a great tour of the airport. So with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Anslow. Um, are there any questions or points of clarification, comments from my colleagues, Mayor Pro Tem DeMont? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Anslow, for the presentation and for being here tonight. Um, good information. Um, I happen to grow up in that neighborhood and still live over in that neighborhood, so I've seen some of these developments over the years. Uh, one of the things I was hoping you could touch on that um, I've heard a lot of questions about is the potential for um, lead coming off of the exhaust of the plane. And I don't know enough about aviation or those planes to know if that's a reality or not, or how you might measure the things that come off the planes that people might be concerned about for health reasons. Um, and that wasn't part of your presentation. But so is that two things? One, I'd like to know if we could get information on that. And two, I would like to take you up on the, the um, request to have us come out and visit the site. I think that would be very helpful for us. It would be great. So fuel, just like fuel at the gas station is regulated by the uh, EPA and the FAA. Um, and aviation fuel is very specific because obviously if you get bad fuel in your car, you start clunking and you pull off to the side of the road, you call it AAA. You can't do that in a plane. So over uh, the last almost two decades, the FAA has been working with companies to get uh, unleaded fuel. We actually use what's called low lead fuel. So it's not like the leaded fuel back in the, in the day when we had put them in our car, but there's still lead in that fuel. Uh, at Oshkosh, which is the biggest kind of uh, fly-in air show of the, in, the, in the world, um, a couple of months back, they announced that a fuel company, and I just don't have it in front of me, um, got permission on specific type clearances for engines. So you can't just make a fuel and nine people have nine different planes and those engines will all take that fuel. So they were able to get the certificate for the Lycoming, I think it's like a 300, 400, 405. Again, don't, please don't quote me on the numbers. Um, that means those engines are certified to use that fuel, which is an unleaded fuel. And as we go forward, those are going to be coming faster and faster. So um, again, the airport, you all, Jefferson County, we have no control over that whatsoever, but it's market driven. And I think enough people have heard about it and done it. And again, the FAA has been working with it, that the uh, Lycoming, which is the number one engine builder for small aircraft, certain types of their engines have been pre-approved now for this fuel. So I think it's coming. Um, I support it. Again, I can't mandate that we sell it. I can't tell a private business that you must sell this fuel. It's our two fuel services, our two FBOs are privately owned and they manage their own business, but I know they support it also. So I think as the next year or so, maybe two to three years comes along, I think that market will shift and I think that unleaded fuel will be pretty much the norm. That's good to know that that's in the future. Um, to follow up with that, so is there any way that the FAA looks at how that exhaust comes off and measures at all in the community, or is that just kind of the way the planes have always been, or you know something that that I could go back to those questions with that kind of speaks to those concerns? I am aware of one study um, that was just recently published, and I can get that to you. I'll send uh, send you a link uh, that talks about it. That there is a link between uh, the lead and the fuel and the thing, but uh, I think at this point 
as far as I am aware, the FAA has not really done a study. This was a private uh, city that funded the study and, and looked into it. Great. I appreciate, again, you being here tonight and answering our questions. Thank you. My pleasure. I see that Councillor Bowles has a question, but before we go there, it looks like perhaps City Manager Tripp, did you have a comment or were you wanting to chime in or am I misreading? No, Mayor, thank you. I'm just uh, listening and enjoying the presentation here and the good questions. Thank you. All right. Um, Councillor Bowles. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Ansel, thank you for being here in the presentation. I appreciate it. Mr. Davis, thank you. And Commissioner Kraft Tharp, uh, thank you for being here. I think it shows a great uh, partnership between Jefferson County and our city. So thank you for that and, and taking the time and, and helping us understand these issues. I don't have to admit, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about the airport yet. I'm learning. Um, is there a flying school at this airport? And are there complaints around all of those planes that are out flying doing a, a, a flight school? So we have one helicopter flight school and four fixed wing flight schools. So yes, uh, roughly 105 aircraft are registered to a flight school. Um, and yes, we do get complaints about a flight school. It's a little bit difficult to say it's just flight school because if I owned a plane and I wanted to defer some of my costs, sometimes I will lease that to the flight school and then students come out and they do the maintenance for you. So it's kind of a trade off. Um, so that plane, could be registered to me. It could be registered. And by the way, I don't own a plane. Jefferson County doesn't pay me enough money. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear that, Commissioner? <laughs> uh, yeah. For um, the benefit of those okay. listening at home, there were some shocked expressions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so that that plane could be registered to me. It could also be registered to the flight school. It just depends on the LLCs that sometimes own it. Um, and it may be a student that comes into that flight school, goes out with an instructor and does their maneuvers. And when you're a student, it's like having a final exam. Every time you go fly, you have a curriculum, you have to perform those maneuvers. Sometimes a new maneuver is introduced. The next time you have to be able to do it. And then the third time you have to do it perfectly. So you're always moving forward. So those maneuvers that people talk about may be a flight school person going through those maneuvers, which are FAA mandated. Or if I own the plane, I have to fly so many landings, so many hours, so many hours at night, so many landings at night, and so on and so on. So again, it may be me taking my own plane out and doing those maneuvers so that I can stay current and actually legally fly my plane. And it could be anywhere in between. It could be people jumping in a plane, flying out somewhere, and uh, they call it the $100 hamburger. They land at an airport. They go in, they have the lunch. They, you know, uh, they have that, and then they fly back to our airport and vice versa. So as the, um, the number of aircraft coming in and out of that airport increase, is there ever a thought? Well, first of all, let me ask you a question first. Do we time those schools and those flights with the, the students to be less invasive on the people around, in the neighborhoods around? Do, do we, we can contemplate that when we say, here's the, the time they fly? We do. Okay. So um when i took over in december of 2017 one of the first meetings i had with as a, a trustee from superior and she called me up and says no one will talk to me i said well, i'll talk to you come come see me so she came out to the airport and she says i've been trying to talk about noise and operations for three years no one will talk to me so i went and actually met and talked just like this to their uh city council we had a uh, open house at the airport we, we went back and forth several times and out of that we created at the time we called it the noise task force uh, and it was business professionals, flight schools, airport advisory, and air traffic controllers all kind of come together and saying, what can we do? So it's, again, it's like saying, well, why, are, why is your Harley, you know, leaving your driveway at 4.30 in the morning for you to go to work? I don't want that. Stop it. Why well, can't? But what we can do is there are procedures and maneuvers that um, the flight schools and all pilots can do, not just the flight schools. And we created a list and it was actually, it's in your brief. Um, so if you get a chance, go back and look at it. And what those are is voluntary, because again, I don't have any authority to mandate procedures or time or anything like that, but voluntary procedures that flight schools can follow that would alleviate some of the noise. And our own air traffic controller stated at a previous roundtable meeting that in her opinion, she'd been an air traffic controller 20 plus years, that about 95% of all the people are following that. Now, again, we get pilots from other airports to come in, so not everyone may be um, following us. The other thing is they actually instituted a curfew at 10 p.m. So it's a little hard in the summer because you have to fly at night. Um, 
to maintain your currency. So when you know it doesn't get dark till nine or nine fifteen, it's almost impossible. But uh, especially during the winter. But that was a, another step that we did. That was a voluntary step that the flight school said. And uh, I had a meeting with them. I guess it was about two weeks ago. And they're less than one percent of their operations are after ten p.m. So again, I think you know those procedures are working. Okay. Thank you for that answer, sir. We have roughly five minutes before our city council meeting um, will begin. I wanted to see, I know we have two other guests in attendance. Um, Mr. Davis or Commissioner Cratharp, did either of you want to speak or add to the presentation? Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Councillor Scully. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Anslow, for attending this meeting and doing this study session tonight. It was a personal ask and I really appreciate your time and commitment to our community. Um, and I have heard these presentations and worked with you a great deal in the last few months. So I appreciate all the time you have given me. Um, and council, I would recommend that we do the tour. Um, the tour is very enlightening and, um, and it's kind of fun to go see the airport. So just saying. <laughs> um, I have some questions and they're questions I actually know the answers to, but I feel like the residents would benefit from hearing them in a different capacity. So um, one of them is, um, there was a recommendation for, to put mufflers onto some of the planes to, to mitigate the sound. And we had an entire presentation on mufflers and what that would do and how it would work. And I was wondering if you could quickly touch on that. Yes, ma'am. So Embry-Riddle about 10 years ago, same thing, they're trying to reduce noise. A manufacturer in Germany created a muffler as an external part that you put on the aircraft. It reduced it, I think by 10 decibels, which is fairly significant. They did thousands of hours of training on the ground. They got the thumbs up from the engineers. FAA said it was okay. They actually started flying the planes and they started having, one of the maneuvers you do when you fly is you pull the power back and you assume you lose an engine. You have to go through certain procedures and then you put the engine forward and you fly away. The problem was with those mufflers, they were finding a reduced response time in that engine. So there was a, a lag and in aviation, you just can't have that. Um, and so they started working with the engineers and eventually they had two engine failures. So they went through that maneuver, they pulled the low power, they went through their procedures and they went to full throttle and the engine stalled. Now they do that over the runway on purpose, just in case uh, this, this, this happens, but they pulled those mufflers off. Um, even if they worked um, and they obviously didn't, Embry-Riddle is in Florida, which is at sea level. We're at 5,000 feet. So uh, it's called density altitude and it's a mathematical equation talks about temperature, humidity, uh, a couple other things that goes in. And on a hot summer day, our air at our airport's uh, level ground seems like it's at 9,000 feet. So those planes don't perform very well. So in, in Florida, they're at, you know, 500 feet off the, off the ground and they can take off and they have that little bit of a margin of extra power. One of the things that we get a lot of complaints about, especially in the summer is well, these planes aren't climbing out very fast. Well, uh, one of our pilots at our last meeting says, when you're a student pilot, you put that throttle full forward and you basically leave it there until the flight's over. Um, you're not really tweaking it and coasting and all that stuff because at our altitude, you need that power. So um, we would have certainly looked into that and been willing to do it, but it just didn't seem like it was a viable option for our airport at the altitude. And ultimately it was a failed experiment. And, and so it puts at risk safety. Yes. And safety is the number one concern here. Absolutely. Right? Okay. And then um, another question I had, you mentioned altitude. Um, we had a lot of conversation about the altitude that planes are required to fly at over our community and how many residents in will say that they don't feel the planes are flying at that altitude. Can you address that a little bit? Yes, ma'am. So we get a lot of those complaints and the, the general rule, and there's, because it's the federal government, the FAA, there's lots of sub rules, but the general rule is an aircraft has to maintain a thousand feet over congested area. So if you were way out to the east over Kansas, you could go lower uh, down to 500 feet. But generally, planes want to fly at 1,000 feet or above because to a plane, altitude is safety. If you lose that engine, you can turn, find a landing, set up those procedures and things. So uh, the other caveat to that is during landing and or takeoff. So especially for Rock Creek, which is less than, a, you know, about 1.1, 1.2 miles off the end of our runway on a hot summer day, that aircraft's climbing out as fast as it can and it just doesn't have the power to get up to a thousand feet before it's over Rock Creek. Trust me, that pilot wants to get up there. They don't want to be low. It's just the nature of the plane they're flying with the altitude and the temperature that we have. So 
a comment that I heard this weekend from a resident was um, the resident felt that the planes um, specifically fly over this individual's home, targeting the home. We had a conversation about that yes, we did. when we did our tour. Is that actually possible? It's, I guess, theoretically, it's possible. But when you're flying a plane, your number one concern is safety. And the other thing that uh, I would like to offer is that the flight schools has offered up what they call discovery flights. So love to get you guys out to an airport, get you uh, into the plane for about 25 minutes, no cost to you all. Because again, when you hear the pilot talking to the radio, moving throttles, switching dials, it, I flew for 21 years. I was a helicopter pilot for the Marine Corps. You don't have time to go, oh, I need to go over Catherine's house and uh, you know give her a little buzz. You're worried about your safety. You're worried about the people who you are flying with. Um, it's just not feasible. They are busy. And we had a discussion with the flight schools and their certified flight instructors, CFIs or professionals, they're going to do a good job. So it's, I'm not saying it's not, it's theoretically possible, but very highly unlikely. Okay. I know I'm out of time. Yeah. So that's great. That's, thank you for letting us know that you have more questions. Um, Mr. Angelo, I appreciate um, this portion of the study session. Um, we are going to move into the special city council meeting at this time. Therefore, the presentation will be paused. Um, at the adjournment of the special meeting, we will resume the study session and complete this presentation. So Councillor Scully can ask and any other colleagues that have questions can um, have, have further questions. So um, please hang tight. Um, I will. This is an issue that many of our residents um, ask us about and are concerned about. And so it's very helpful to hear this from you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. The time is 7.01 and we are now convening as Westminster City Council for a special council meeting. Um, we've already done a Pledge of Allegiance earlier um, during our study session, but I will ask City Clerk Parker to please lead us in roll call. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Present. Mayor Seitz. Here. Councillor Seymour. Here. Councillor Scully. Here. Councillor Smith. Present. And Councillor Bowles. Here. Um, the purpose of our special council meeting tonight is to go over some ballot initiatives for the November ballot. The first item before us um, is item B. This is Councilor's Bill number 32. Can I get a motion? I believe we need to read it into oh, that. <laughs> Actually, maybe I can't do that. Somebody else. Okay. Um, so you withdraw the mayor pro tem? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to pass Councilor's Bill Number 32, placing questions on the November 2021 election ballot to amend the charter. Okay. Councilor Voles? I second the motion. There's been a motion and a second. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns on this item from my colleagues? Um, and I just want to let you all know, unfortunately, um, I don't have the display of who's up, so I'm going to have to be looking around. So if I miss you, please let me know. Seeing no questions, comments, or concerns, this is Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Mayor Seitz. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. And Councillor Bowles. Yes. Councillor's Bill number 32 passes on second reading with a vote of six to zero. The next item before us is resolution number 30. Is there a motion from one of my colleagues? Ma'am, I move. Uh, uh, Councillor Scully. I move to adopt resolution number 30, placing questions on the November 2021 ballot, establishing a tax on the sale of retail marijuana and allowing the operation of retail marijuana businesses. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Second. There is a um, motion and a second. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns on this item? Councillor Smith. Uh, this is in alignment with, I will be voting no, this is in alignment with uh, our study session a couple of weeks ago. I feel like we're inundating uh, the voters towards uh, having so much on the ballot. Uh, this is one of them that I don't feel that we need at this time. Thank you. 
Um, Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, being consistent also in the discussion that I had during the study session too, um, this is a, a personal and principal objection to the sale of marijuana in our city, so I will also be voting no. Thank you for those comments. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I had a quick question for staff. Um, so I'm assuming that a lot of the um, uses for the tax are dictated by state law as far as education to avoid use of minors, but there's a, on the section that says other city expenses, I'm curious, um, is there any limit to what those funds could be used for if this passes and we end up using this sort of tax? City Manager Tripp, who would you like to answer that question? Yeah, uh, Larry Dore and uh, Chris Lindsay are going to handle these responses. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dore. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, any lawful purpose that is described as sort of any other expenditure could be uh, authorized for the use of these funds. Of course, all appropriations are ultimately authorized by the City Council and would be uh, under your purview and so forth. So, uh, in essence, any any lawful purpose, but of course, there would be primary costs to uh, regulate the purchase and sale of, of marijuana in our city, and that would be uh, what staff would recommend the first uh, dollars of revenue be used for. And then beyond that, it would be uh, to the purview of the city council. Great. And I guess the, the follow-up to that is my understanding of this is if this were to go to the voters, then this um, we'd have to do an ordinance in order to actually um, regulate or authorize the sale of marijuana in the city. So at that point, if that were to be the direction that we go, could that ordinance also act as a control as to what those tax revenues would be spent on as a city? Well, uh, I think the city attorney might uh, want to go ahead and address that. I, I think he'll probably guide you that, that is indeed within your, your purview and control. Thank you, Mr. Dora. Uh, Dave Frankel, city attorney. And, and yes, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott, I, I believe that the regulatory steps that would be undertaken by city council would be to amend the code Right now, the Westminster Municipal Code bans marijuana-related businesses within our city. So if council were to enact um, permissive uses for marijuana in the city and business licensure, that sort of thing, first they'd have to repeal the uh, sections which ban it, and that uh, new section could then address what types of marijuana regulations uh, should be enacted by city council. And yes, the, the, the funding can absolutely be addressed by city council at that time. Great. Um, that answers all my questions that I've heard some of these questions in the community. And so I wanted to go on the record um, on a couple of things. One, I will be supporting this. I actually um, had pushed to have this come back. And the, where this came up was last year um, during our, our budget retreat, um, especially in a time where we weren't sure how things were going to shake out with COVID. We had talked about the potential of using uh, marijuana sales as a revenue source. Um, and so people understand this isn't necessarily something that the city does have to put out to the voters. However, I think it's a question that should be asked to voters. Um, and so I, I think the proper path in my mind is for this to go to the voters and know whether or not the citizens of Westminster want to see the sales of marijuana inside their city. And so that's kind of why this is in front of us. And, and I will be supporting it because I think at the end of the day, this decision should be made by the people who live in the city, not the city council. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Are there any other comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Mayor Seitz. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. Councillor Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. No. Councillor Bowles. Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Resolution number 30 is adopted on a vote of four to two. The next item before us is resolution number 31. Councillor Scully, do you want to complete? I do, ma'am. Um, I move to adopt resolution number 31, placing a question on the November 2021 ballot regarding an increase in the public safety sales and use tax. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Second. There has been a motion and a second. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. 
Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Voles. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. And Mayor Seitz. Yes. Resolution number 31 is adopted on a vote of six to zero. The next item before us is resolution number 32. Can I get a motion, Councillor Scully? I move to adopt resolution number 32, placing a question on the November 2021 ballot regarding the continuation of the parks, open space, and trails post tax. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns on this? Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, along with the study session a few weeks ago, uh, I was a no vote on this moving forward. Um, I think we're too far in advance to truly understand what we'll be using these funds on, so I will be a no vote. Um, Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I thought long and hard about this too, and I knew I know that we're um, taking proactive action in, uh, regarding our uh, expiration of this tax too, but with the limited amount of land that we have available before build out, we need to be um, very nimble in, in the money that we have to acquire any spaces that come available to us. So I think this will give us some room from that standpoint. And our residents have told us um, um, biannual survey after biannual survey, how important open space and trails are to their well being. And in 2020, it absolutely proved that. So I'll be a yes vote. Thank you. And um, I also want to weigh in on this. This is an issue that um, I brought forward along with Councillor Voles and um, have enjoyed the support of the majority of council on doing this because as um, Councillor Seymour rightly pointed out, um, our parks and our open spaces went from being amenities um, in previous years to necessities to our residents. Um, Westminster is reaching build out. Um, and by allowing bonding, it allows us to purchase some critical um, prioritized parcels when they become available um, and allows us to move swiftly um, to protect something that our, our community members really enjoy. Um, so with that, I will be joining my colleagues and voting yes on this item. Um, and I apologize, Mayor Pro Tem, I did not see your light on. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to, to add on to this. Um, I agree with everything that Councillor Seymour and Mayor sites stated as far as why this is important. The other thing I just want to point out to the public and thank my colleagues, this was a work in progress. I don't think at first when this came up, there was a unanimous support as far as how we do this. And I think that we worked hard to come up with something that the majority of council is comfortable with. So I'm pleased to support this tonight. Well, thank you so much for those comments. This is a roll call vote. Oh, my apologies. Oh, ready. Okay, she's ready to vote. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Councillor yeah. Scully. Yes. Councillor Smith. No. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Mayor Seitz. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. Resolution number 32 is adopted on a vote of five to one. The final item on tonight's um, special council meeting is resolution number 33. Councillor Scully. I move to adopt resolution number 33, placing a question on the November 2021 ballot regarding the creation of a commission to further explore charter amendments, providing for the election of city councilors from geographic wards. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Second. There has been a motion and a second. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns on this item? Councilor Bowles. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I just wanna say that this actually, this concept was has been talked about for a long time. When I first came on council, one of my first uh, meetings with a council member was Councillor DeMott or Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. And he asked me, he said, will you consider this? And we looked at it, we both uh, talked about it at length. Uh, I'll be supporting this tonight. I think it makes a lot of sense in our city to have a mix of wards and at large. And we don't know yet how that will specifically come down, but I will vote for this because I think it takes us a step farther in that direction. So I want to thank um, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott because we did have a good conversation and kind of led us down the path of working together on this issue so thank you mayor pro tem um i was going to add to that i mean last year we talked about this i think this is another one of those things that um since i've been involved i've been hearing the question and i think this is obviously something the voters are going to have to decide whether or not that's how they want their representation to be selected um so i appreciate the support of my colleagues in this i know last year we talked about putting this on the ballot and um, the majority feel was it was the wrong year for it COVID. Um, so I appreciate the fact that when I asked if we could move this to next year and at least make the commitment and put it on the ballot, 
everybody agreed on that and, that and that's what brings us here tonight. So I look forward to supporting this because I think it's time for the, the residents to say whether or not they want to move this direction and selecting their representation. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for those comments. I'm also going to be supporting this move tonight. Um, whenever we amend our charter, um, particularly when it comes to how our residents are represented by their elected body, um, it is important that we're intentional and thoughtful and we follow best practices and understand the implications of any changes. Um, this commission will have a, um, if passed, an important charge um, to make sure that we are doing a good job of figuring out how to establish um, boards and commissions. So um, with, with that said, I will be also joining and supporting this tonight. This is a roll call vote. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Bowles. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Mayor Sipes. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Scully. Yes. Resolution number 33 is adopted with a vote of six to zero. And this adjourns our special council meeting. My apologies to the Jeffco commissioners, county manager, and our representative um, from the airport. For We appreciate you waiting, but uh, Councillor Scully did make it clear she had some additional questions for you. Um, so if we can welcome you back to uh, the podium, Mr. Anslow. And I, they're short questions and only two. No worries. <laughs> okay. Um, the other question that I have is the growth of the airport. Um, I know that it's been in the plans for many years. Is it runways? Is it more um, hangars? What kind of growth are we looking at? So we, there was a contemplation of an extra runway um, in one of the previous master plans. Operationally, it doesn't make sense. So I do not see that happening. Um, if you're familiar with the airport, and where Pilatus is and then Sims Road. Mm -hmm. um, on the west of Sims Road, there's actually 170 acres of what's designated by the FAA as aeronautical land. Um, that land will be developed and most likely uh, to develop it, there'll have to be a taxiway going from our current runway system. Uh, Sims will have to be relocated and that taxiway will go out into that 170 acres. And as part of that, um, you can look at the master plan kind of shows a big picture but you can also look at uh, what the airport advisory board did in our developmental framework. They kind of took those parcels of land and put highest and best use to them. Um, and then I'm sure many of you have heard of our strategic business plan. Um, and that strategic business plan took that one step further and kind of really laid out some of the proper uh, acreage required for our minimum standards, our FAA standards. And so you would see what we would call kind of a mix. Obviously there's gonna be some taxiway and some ramps some hangars, some different types of development, but ultimately we're market driven. Um, I always like to use the term spaceport or drone port, right? Because you hear them, but you don't really know what they're going to be. And the FAA is very careful when they give you grants that we sign grant, actually the county commissioner signed grant assurances and we can't discriminate against certain types of business. So when people say, well, you just tell us you'll never let another flight school and we'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Legally, I can't do that. Now, what I can do and what's really important about the strategic business plan and why we've been pushing that forward is it allows us to shape the marketplace so that if a flight school approached me, let's just say Embry-Riddle says, we want to bring 100 planes and a campus over there and we want to put it right here. If they did that today, I would be hard pressed to say no. And we'd, the Jefferson County would be sued and could be sued by both that uh, firm and the FAA. What I can do with the strategic business plan is say, you know, we really want to set this land aside for higher and better use. And your flight school may fit back in this far, far corner, but we won't be developed back there for another 10 years. Um, and it allows us to basically shape that marketplace for the highest and best use. One of the things about that airport is um, they kind of did whoever came first. They didn't really have a good planning um, over the years. And so we've got smaller, less uh, appropriate hangars right next to our biggest runway, which is where you would want your bigger planes and your bigger hangars. And we've got bigger hangars farther away. Again, it's almost kind of backwards. So um, does that answer your question? It absolutely does. You actually answered it a little bit more, which I appreciate. Um, and it it kind of led to another question, um, which I'm still trying to formulate in my head. So I may come back to it if I can put it together. Um, the other question on my list here is, so the runways go in certain directions. We know the mountains are in one direction. We know the east is in another direction. Um, what does it take to change those directions? And 
If we could, would it be a good idea? So the runways, when they are built, they are built basically on what's called the favorable winds. In aviation, you always want to fly into a headwind. So the FAA and the airport authority back in the day studied for, you know, farmer's almanac or whatever they did in the 60s. And they said the prevailing winds are this. And they laid those runways out. Air traffic control with safety as their primary goal sets the runway in use. So the runways to move them would cost, you know, hundreds of million dollars. That's just not going to happen. To change those runways or, you know, to change the landing direction is based on the wind. And the FAA through their air traffic controllers are always going to direct the airport, uh, the planes into the, the prevailing wind. Now, sometimes there's a crosswind and that's why we have that one short crosswind um, things because the bigger the plane, you can land with a bigger crosswind. You have more capability. Smaller planes don't have that. And so in a crosswind, they may not be able to land. So as a safety factor, they put that crosswind runway in. And so you'll see occasionally uh, and during our tour, we were talking about that plane looks odd. And it was like, oh, because it took off from our crosswind runway because of the way the wind strikes. But um, we have no authority over it. No one in Jefferson County has authority is it. The air traffic control supervisor and their air traffic controllers up in the cab control that 100% and would never change it other than for ultimate safety. Okay. I can think of a million more questions, but um, I'm here I, all night. <laughs> I, I appreciate the questions you have answered. I would like a discovery flight personally, um, just to see what that feels like and, and what pilots see at those altitudes. So I may take you up on that. And I would like to invite the residents of Westminster to reach out to Mr. Anslow and the airport for tours. Um, I think it's very enlightening. And um, it helps understanding of the airport and its presence in our community. So I appreciate your time tonight and um, for allowing us to ask questions. My pleasure. I will also throw out that now that we're post COVID, before COVID hit, we would go out to residents' houses and we would sit with them on their back patio and explain that when a plane is flying over that it's not at 200 feet, it's actually about a thousand feet or well, why is he turning there? Or, and actually kind of make them understand. And we had very good success with that uh, prior to COVID. And um, I've actually offered that up to a couple of people now that we're post COVID, haven't been uh, taken up on it yet, but uh, if you have constituents that want me to come out and uh, my staff to come out, we'll sit with them and explain what's, you know, we always hear, why is he flying over my house? We'll be able to explain it in the best manner that we can. So for anyone who's listening, we have that uh, as an option also. Thank you very much, Mr. Anzal. I actually have just a couple of questions. You showed us a chart with the number of flights um, per year, and I think it started in 1970 was the beginning of that. Yes, and and in, in those early years, you actually had even more flights than you have currently. Um, but over the last decade, there's been quite a fluctuation um, in the number of flights. Do you um, have any explanation for why there were so um, there, there were less operations um, maybe in the 10 previous years. Yes, ma'am. So the 70s was what they called the heyday of general aviation. Planes were cheap, gas was cheap, maintenance was cheap. So if you had you know, a couple thousand dollars, you and a couple friends could get. So that's why when you look at the 70s, and there's a lot of planes that are still flying that were built in the 70s. There were more planes built in the 70s that are still flying today because the engine technology is basically, and the wing technology is the same. Um, aviation follows the economy. So if you look back and I don't know if they can go back and find that slide or not. It would be helpful. Um, so Austin, if you can hook me up and go back to the uh, operation slide. While he's trying to find that, we follow the uh, uh, aviation follows the economy. So if you look at like 2008, we're pretty strong. 2009, we went down 2010. And then it takes a while to come back because obviously, you know, you've got your house, your food, you know, your essentials, a lot of times, Flying is not an essential. The difference in today's economy and why aviation is exploding right now is because of the shortage of pilots. Um, U.S. pilots are forced to retire at 65. So that number, every day they drop off, I think the number's 2,000. Again, don't quote me on those numbers. I can look them up if you want. But um, every day that happens. It's just those pilots are going out the door. And there's only one way to get those pilots and that's for those to go through that flight training and go through those flight schools to learn. And so they are predicting a hundred thousand pilot shortage in the, by 2030. Uh, that means our flights to Hawaii or, you know, wherever we're all going, Cancun, they're not going to have pilots to do that. So route shortages are going to start happening. Things. So um, 
you look at the issues that are going on with public education and colleges and the cost and the people who are getting degrees at hundreds of thousands of dollars and then can't find a job. One of our flight schools, but all of our flight schools, one of them is uh, very tuned into Denver uh, State and they go to class at Denver, they come fly and they have a job waiting for them at an airline the day they finish their, their prerequisites. So uh, it's inexpensive, it's not inexpensive, but it's a lot cheaper than college and you have a guaranteed job. And so a lot of young people are looking, a lot of old people, I know people who are in their forties and stuff are going, I could go and get an airline job, you know, spend two years training and have 15 or 20 years of uh, a great job traveling around the world, making fantastic money. So they're doing career changes, as I'm sure all of you have seen with career changes in, in different businesses. So uh, we are in a very unique situation where that's going to happen. Ah, there he goes. He found him. So yeah, if you look at, uh, I can hardly see the, name, the numbers, but they're in the, uh, you know, 2010, 2011 timeframe, we kind of bottomed out. And then we've just been slowly growing at about eight to 12% per year since then. And then you kind of look at, uh, you know, in the seventies when we had the gas crunch. And so then the, the numbers started going down again. Well, I, I appreciate this. And, you know, it helps also explain why folks who maybe have lived in this neighborhood for a decade feel like it's increased because it has, but um, it shows that over the, the timeline of the airport, it's not dramatically different than, than probably the, the mean. Um, I really appreciate that you spent a lot of time tonight discussing authority and accountability and kind of divvying up what you're accountable for and, and the authority you have versus other agencies. Mm -hmm. um, this is an issue, I think all of my colleagues will agree that when we're at the door or at community forums, we hear about. And people are passionate about it, it's their homes, right? This is where they raise their kids, this is where they spend their time, this is their, um, th this is where they go for their respite. Um, and so these can be passionate conversations. But I think the more that we hear from each other, understand both the public value that we get from the airport and the public impact that we have on residents, um, we can all do our part to try to make sure um, we're communicating those concerns are heard and getting to the appropriate authorities um, and not taking more than is our charge or what we, you know, there's, there's very limited what we can do. Um, but we are happy to have you here to educate us um, as local electeds be that liaison um, and then to also help facilitate conversations for you at the appropriate level. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming. It would be helpful for me in the future. I don't expect you to have this data available to, right now, um, but how many businesses in the region rely on um, the airport for their supply chain um, or for the, their operations um, that they rely on that? And if we know how many employees are employed by them. Um, so CDOT Aeronautics does a, a report, the one slide kind of had a little respite from that, and it goes into a little bit of depth. I don't know if it's the depth that you were thinking, but it does talk about on airport jobs and the secondary jobs and sort of all that that follows along. And I can send you that in a link. I, it it um, caught my interest when you mentioned that Ball Aerospace has let you know that their um, location here was connected to the airport. And I didn't realize it was that direct of a connection to the airport, which is my ignorance. So I was wondering if that is a, a, a tale that, or, you know, that is um, true with other large corporations like that. And so I just wanted to, to learn more. Um, but I appreciate this. And I would ask any residents that are listening, please always feel free. I know there were some folks who wanted to present as community members tonight, and that's not how study sec sessions are structured. Um, every single council meeting we do have a time for resident comments. Anyone who's listening that wants to come and have their opinions heard can come for that period of time. Thank you, Mr. Anslow. Are there any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, um, we appreciate you coming out okay. tonight and we appreciate the conversation. Mr. Davis, it looks like you moved towards the front. Were you wanting to say a few words or were you? No, ma'am, I'll call it covered. It was the it was the shortage of pilots and the, and the background. That's also economically driven. You know, when there's hundreds of thousands or there's a forecast of hundreds of thousands of, of short pilots, some of those business owners that own those pilot schools will tell you that they used to be mechanics. They built their businesses from the ground up and now they're, they're reaching that opportunity to really get back what they've invested into that business. So they've got hundreds of students, each of the schools, and, and the demand for those students is growing. And so the demand across the country, I can also tell you, Paul can tell you this too, living around uh, various parts of the country, 
uh, general aviation airports are all challenged with encroachment um, and the, the issues of, of growing together with the community. There's always, uh, there's always noise uh, and there's always those challenges. So, you know, responsible growth on the front range is a challenge that we're gonna continue to see, you know, for the future. Uh, everybody sees that here in the front range. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Um, this is a great opportunity. I would absolutely encourage you to come out to the airport and, and walk the grounds and visit some of the businesses, the corporate headquarters that count on those corporate flights to visit some of their different educate or different sites and so forth. It's really an amazing place and a beautiful airport. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Davis. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, seeing no other comments or questions, we now will go back to the beginning of the agenda. Um, reports from the mayor. Um, I do just want to recognize we have in uh, the audience tonight, Ms. Juliet Abdel, and we, um, we did have the State of the City with uh, the Westminster Chamber of Commerce uh, this week. It was a great event. Um, they did a wonderful job uh, hosting it, um, and we were happy to report on um, both what has happened in the city this last year and where we are headed. Um, Next, I would, and the last thing I'd like to mention is we did have um, the graduation for our very first Civics Academy. Um, it was a wonderful event. I was joined by most of the council that could attend um, and to, uh, to celebrate these residents that went through an eight week program, 35 hours of learning what it takes to run the city, uh, learning about the dedication of our, of our employees. Um, and to a person, they, they raved about it. The only suggestion I heard was that they wished it was even longer. <laughs> so, and some were um, wanting to have follow-up tours of additional um, city facilities. Um, are there any uh, comments or reports from my colleagues? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just real briefly, um, today was the board meeting for the Butterfly Pavilion. I'd say since uh, Mr. Tennyson, who is the head of the Butterfly Pavilion team and gave you guys an update, there was not anything new. They just continue to um, improve business as they come out of COVID. Exciting things going on in their capital campaign for their new facility in Broomfield. Um, so it was a good meeting, but I wouldn't say there was any new uh, information that Mr. Tennyson didn't share with you all. Thank you for that report. And for anyone who gets the Washington Post, the um, Butterfly Pavilion was highlighted in it for their um, work to help save coral. Um, is um, dying off. There's a disease off the coast of Florida. So it was great to see uh, the work of our locals um, to, to try to help um, combat that. Next up, I see Councillor Voles. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I also wanted to uh, thank staff for their work on the uh, Citizens Academy. It was a wonderful event and uh, lots of positive feedback. So clerk's office, I know Abby Fitch was very involved and uh, Cody Erb was very involved and, and all our department heads and uh, all of your work, um, I appreciate that. The, uh, the feedback was very positive, so thank you for that. We even had some folks saying they're going to come to our budget sessions. I'm like, that's really, I think that says a lot. Uh, Mr. Dory, you must have done a really good job on that. So, <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for that. I think it was very positive, and I was glad we were uh, included at least a little bit in it, and I uh, appreciate that and all the effort that went into it. Also, the state of the city was a very successful event, and we had Juliet Abdel from the Westminster Chamber here. Thank you for your work on that. You did a fantastic job. It was a great event. Mayor, wonderful speech. Uh, and I like this year you included the um, kind of questions afterwards and more of a kind of a discussion. I thought that was really neat. So I would, I'd like to see that in the future, but whatever happens, happens. But um, thank you for that. And also, I want to thank staff. I know the city attorney's office were very involved, and um, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Lindsay's office was very involved. That was a heavy lift on the ballot initiatives on those language and the language we approved tonight. And I know we went back and forth and I think we have really good language because we did all discuss it. We had really tremendous discussions in depth talking about how we can make it better. So I want to thank staff, um, both the city attorney's office and the city attorney and uh, Mr. Lindsay and his staff for, and everyone else who contributed. That was a heavy lift to get that done in time. So thank you. Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, um, Wednesday was one of those busy days, so I took the opportunity to join State of the City at the beginning part, but I also had uh, uh, the great honor to attend the uh, Public Works and Utilities uh, celebration and wrap, wrap up of the, um, uh, the uh, of course, I can't pronounce it right there without seeing the uh, 
high service pump station at Semper's Barbecue. Um, I want to uh, thank um, uh, Julie K Kaler for all the work that she put into that. Uh, great opportunity to tour that uh, new facility that will help um, provide a steady water stream out of that plant uh, to our residents and then the backup redundancy that was placed in that building. So it was great to meet the uh, contractors that take great pride in their work and doing work for our city and uh, hear the comments about how uh, staff and the contractors work collaboratively to bring that project to fruition. Thank you, Councillor Seymour. Are there any other comments or reports? I'm sorry, Councillor Scully. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I too attended this day of the suit. Fabulous job, Ms. Juliet Abdel. Thank you very much. Um, also the Citizens Academy, great success and just amazing to see that lifted. Um, I also attended the um, funeral services for former officer Von Pepper, and he was a, a great um, contributor to our community with a coffee shop and service to our city for so many years. And um, our city owes his family a great deal of debt. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, his passing and that we're very sad um, for his family. And then also um, last week, we had a Jeff West Community Forum um, candidate um, presentation as well. So those are starting. So I'll be looking for them in the community. It's a great opportunity to get to know your um, potential elected. So. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing other, no other comments or questions. Um, there is a report. Is there a report from the city official? Mr. Tripp. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just very briefly, I want to thank my colleague, Don Davis, for pulling together the Rocky Mountain uh, presentation this evening and being here uh, and uh, stretching across the entire meeting. I appreciate that, that support and doing a great job with that. I also want to tell folks that are that were watching this that if you'd like a copy of the presentation, please contact my office and we'll make sure that you get that. Um, so council, uh, good job on that part of the this evening, particularly um, very transparent discussion about an important issue. And I really appreciate uh, you uh, taking the uh, initiative to get that in front of the public so we can begin these conversations. And I would uh, recommend to you uh, to take a visit to the airport to see their operations firsthand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tripp. That is the last item on our agenda for our study session. Um, we The time is 7.36 and we are adjourned. Thank you.